Well, thank you very much for joining us here today for this panel called From Wildfire to Water, Investing in Nature-Based Solutions to Build Climate Resilience. We've got four remarkable uh, uh, panelists uh, coming from three different continents uh, to discuss the importance of nature-based solutions in our international effort to tackle climate change. My name is Wade Crowfoot, and I serve as our California Natural Resources Secretary, uh, focused on the intersection between uh, reducing our greenhouse gas pollution, so-called climate mitigation, and protecting our people and nature from the impacts of climate change, which we all know as climate adaptation or resilience. The last several months have been quite trying in California. And as I record here today, we continue to battle over two dozen major fires across the state. Wildfire, drought, flooding are all natural to California's ecology, but have all worsened as a result of global climate change. The science is clear and the facts tell the story. Global warming has increased temperatures in both the summer and the winter in California, which in the context of wildfire has exacerbated uh, our wildfire danger. Uh, what used to burn as smaller, uh, more localized wildfires uh, have grown into major catastrophic wildfires um, that threaten nature and communities across our state. This summer, uh, more acreage has burned than any other year in California's history, and we're still only partway through the wildfire season. We are very focused in California to continue to work with our international partners to transition to low carbon economies uh, that reduce carbon pollution to stabilize the climate. But we also know that as we do that, we need to protect our communities and our natural places from the impacts of climate change that are already here in California. Our governor, Gavin Newsom, uh, put it to the rest of the country that California is America fast forward when it comes to the impacts of climate change. So we're very focused with leaders like Senator Henry Stern, who's joining us today, and the governor and other leaders uh, on really utilizing nature-based solutions across our state uh, to both, both help with our, our climate goals, carbon reduction goals, because of their ability to sequester or re remove carbon from the atmosphere and the work we can do uh, within our nature uh, to reduce the impacts of these climate uh, of climate change uh, to our natural environment and our people. So I'm very excited to be hosting this discussion here today. And of course, California uh, is very thankful to be involved in uh, United Nations Climate Week. We will hear from, as I said, four panelists today uh, ranging from three continents. We'll start with Hank uh, Ovink, who is essentially the Netherlands uh, leader on all things water. I've had, the, I've had the privilege of working with Hank for several years, and he not only is a leader in the Netherlands and Europe on water, but he is a key advisor to unite, the United Nations leadership on water. And while wildfire is obviously in the news this summer, at least in, in our country, we know uh, that we have to do a lot more uh, to actually build climate resilience on water and that those actions can really help on the climate mitigation side. So we're, we're pleased to be uh, joined uh, by Hank. Uh, we are then moving to Margot Robbins, who's the co-founder and executive director of the Cultural Fire Management Council and a member of the Yurok tribe. Uh, Margot is a leader uh, in one of the key solutions that frankly, tribal communities uh, have been introducing in our forests since time immemorial uh, that they are reteaching to the Cal California state government and, and other governments, which is uh, prescribed fire and the use of fire uh, to help uh, manage the health of our environment. Then we'll move on to Karen Shippey, uh, who is the Chief Director of Environmental Sustainability and the Departmental Technical uh, Gender Focal Point uh, within South Africa uh, for the Western Cape government. Uh, Western Cape government is a key subnational leader uh, on all things climate change. And she'll talk about the work uh, of that government on, on nature-based solutions. And then we'll close with uh, my colleague and friend, Senator Henry Stern, who is one of California's clear leaders on climate action and a really articulate voice around elevating the importance of natural and working lands, nature-based solutions into our efforts here in California. 
So without further ado, let's turn it over to Hank and uh, hear your perspective uh, as we kick off UN Climate Week today. Thank you so much, Wade, uh, and thank you all for uh, being with us uh, and uh, organizing this important event to talk about nature. Uh, I'll start a bit with uh, an example. Uh, I had a, a what we do, I do work around the world, and I got a WhatsApp message by uh, my good friend and partner, Mr. Abir, who is the chief planning officer of the city of Kulna uh, last year. And he said, Hank, the mangroves saved Kulna city. Uh, and the mangroves of the northern edge of the Bangladesh Sundarbans in between the Moyer and Rupsa River protected uh, Kulna city and so many other environments uh, uh, when another uh, uh, cyclone, and this time it was the cyclone Bobo, hit uh, southern Bangladesh. So nature helps us protect. Uh, in 2015, we agreed upon 17 development goals, the SDGs, we all know it. Not to cherry pick from, but as a holistic, comprehensive agenda for sustainable development. Social, economic, cultural, and environmental challenges and opportunities are all interlinked. And these interdependence determine the way we live, determine the way we can drive, but also how to invest. The mangroves and the Sundarbans, uh, like so many other natural environments, eco environments, are the living proof of these interdependencies and their resilient and sustainable capacity. <laughs> but they also demand that we take care of them, uh, protect them, uh, and make sure that they can be resilient. In places, and uh, we are in a world where uh, uh, the pandemic is now hitting hard, uh, in all those places that are already vulnerable by war, conflict, climate change, and poverty, this pandemic is the breaking point. And it's not only exposing how complex and interconnected our challenges are, it also reveals transcending solutions. Eh? In these connections are opportunities and pathways forward. Investing in water, sanitation and hygiene is the first line of defense and the first step towards a sustainable recovery. With the current pandemic, our disconnect with our environment, our ecology is exposed disastrously. Repairing that relationship is not enough. The SDG promise, the Paris Agreement promise we put on the table in 2015 is non-negotiable. It is about all SDGs in their relationship. And it is by nature that we can learn, leapfrog, replicate, and scale our sustainability actions, addressing all of these 17 sustainable development goals at once. But for that, we need continuity, consistency, and commitment to make these sustainable actions happen. A safe place, a platform of collaboration, as well as the best understanding of real knowledge, capacity and talent in these systems, uh, these natural environments. And that can, of course, come from books and experts and research, but also has to come from indigenous and local cultural knowledge. Experience is as important as research. So we must continue to bring the diversity of talent together. Inclusion, is not a tick the box. Eh? It has to come from the heart and the mind. And the goal is to have comprehensive understanding, increased awareness across all parts of society, rather than only bringing in the experts or scientists with a model. We must change course, face the complexity of the challenges head on and develop comprehensive solutions that add value across all needs. It means finding ways for holistic business cases to validate these investments. This is not only about finance and economy, it's about the environment, our culture, our society. And for that, we have to include all stakeholders from day one and collaboratively develop a more future-proof added value type of investment that can also rally people around, again, by nature. But we lack a steady flow of sustainable investment. If we continue to replicate the past, we'll end up more vulnerable, more unequal and more fragile than before. Our promises compete with outdated infrastructure investment. Our commitment is challenged by vested interest in past mechanisms. We need to accelerate and expand the robust pipeline of investment opportunities across the 2030 agenda. We must practice what we preach. Investing in water across the agenda is the added value enabler we so urgently need. So let's build a robust blue and green pipeline of sustainable, transformative investment opportunities now, 
start to deliver on our promise. And that can only happen by nature. It is by nature that we can change course, that we can change the world and deliver on the promise we made. Together, we can do this by nature for sure. We must. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hank. And I want to come back to you in our discussion around how we can collectively come together and really make sure these nature-based solutions are really elevated as they should be in the broad you know, UN discussion leading up to the Conference of Parties next year. Uh, but let's move on to uh, Margot and hear of your perspective, uh, given you're a leader on these topics. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today. Ayukui, Nick now Margo Robbins, Keechnack, co-founder and executive director of the Cultural Fire Management Council, as well as co-lead and advisor for the Indigenous Peoples Burn Network. The Cultural Fire Management Council, CFMC, is a community-based nonprofit organization located on the Yurok Reservation in far Northern California. CFMC was formed as a means to reinstate traditional burn practices and protect our community for, from wildfire. We've been doing cultural burns for seven years now with zero escapes. We've adapted traditional fire practices to accommodate the changed landscape we now live in. We have a family-led burn program, which enables families to burn around their homes and gathering places, and a firefighter training program called TREX. Cultural burn training exchanges, TREX, are conducted with qualified firefighters, fire engines, and a burn plan approved by CAL FIRE. TREX events provide hands-on experience in prescribed fire implementation and ecosystem restoration while creating fire breaks for wildfire prevention. These low intensity controlled burns are good for the land, water, plants, animals, and the people. As native people, we depend on fire for the continuance of our culture. Some of the plants we rely on for basket weaving materials need fire in order to reproduce. Our traditional food sources such as deer, salmon, acorns, and berries also benefit from fire. Fire improves animal habitat, increases forest resilience and biodiversity. The biochar left in its wake makes the soil more fertile, purifies the water, and sequesters carbon in the soil. Wildfire emits carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that continue, contribute to global warming. The toxic smoke from these fires blankets our community for weeks on end. The one good thing about this smoke is that it reduces the temperature of the river. Before the lightning ignited red salmon fire, we were on the verge of another massive fish kill on the Klamath River due to low flows and increased water temperatures. Salmon were starting to get gill rot until smoke from the wildfires blocked out the sun for several days, dropping the water temperatures enough for the salmon to survive. Unfortunately, what saved the salmon obliterated several communities and disintegrated the forest that would normally remove carbon dioxide from the air. The world is talking about how to reduce the likelihood of future blazes. If we do not reduce the massive amounts of brush growing in the forest, it will act as fuel for wildfire. Prescribed fire can be used to help reduce the spread and impact of wildfires. Fire set during favorable conditions clears the understory of brush and timber, leaving the trees unharmed. We start at the top of the slope and back the fire slowly down the mountain, consuming the brush and woody debris on the forest floor. Firefighters use back burning as one of their primary tactics to fight wildfire. We should be doing back burning on a landscape level before the wildfires start. Government tribes, government agencies, tribes, NGOs, and private citizens need to work together to reduce the likelihood of future blazes. CAL FIRE is, 
gearing up to implement a burn boss certification process for private landowners. CFMC plans to design a training program for landowners to gain the practical knowledge and experience to attain this certification. This will put fire back into the hands of the people. It would be good if California, in fact, all states had a gross negligence standard for prescribed burn liability. Prescribed burn programs need to be fully funded and staffed. Cultural burns should be exempt from air quality regulations. And finally, we need to change the narrative about fire. There is such a thing as good fire. It is a necessary part of the ecosystem. Indigenous people have the knowledge to lead us out of this global warming crisis we're facing. It is written on our DNA. Thank you. Thank you, Margo. It's so important to have your voice and your leadership here. And this is a remarkable story in California. Uh, we have one of what we consider the world's most sophisticated firefighting source, uh, forces in CAL FIRE but we've taken off the prescribed burns off the land as, as a state government. And now we're learning from the Yurok and other tribal communities uh, about uh, how we can expand these prescribed burns. Really to Hank's point, uh, actually uh, including these traditional practices, the traditional ecological knowledge of communities that have been stewarding our nature for millennia. Uh, so it's really exciting and I'll, I'll note that a bill was just introduced in the United States Senate uh, that would have national implications and vastly expand our ability to do this prescribed fire, recognizing, as Margot says, that we need to change our mentality to understand that some fire is good for our ecology and good for our people. So now we're going to shift uh, several thousand miles uh, to the east or to the west uh, to the African continent and hear from Karen about the work happening in South Africa on these issues. Thank you very much, and it's great to be with you uh, from so far away. Um, as you said, I'm Western Cape government, which is a subnational government. Uh, we have a climate and an environment that's very similar to California in a lot of ways. We have a Mediterranean climate. We have fantastic wines. Um, and in fact, our climate change journey started about 20, 25 years ago. And really, because subnational government in South Africa does not have control over energy and energy policy, a lot of the mitigation options were not available to us. So our strategy itself responded very significantly to the adaptation components and adaptation particularly with nature-based responses. So just looking at our very recent past, agriculture is one of our sectors that has really had a rough ride the last couple of years. Not only have we had extensive wildfires, but we had a one in a thousand year drought uh, between 2015 and 2019. And some of our agricultural areas are still in that same drought. We haven't actually seen a break in that drought yet. So we're seeing extensive diseases as well in our agricultural sector. And what we did with them was essentially a program called Smart Agri where we broke our area down into 23 microclimates and engaged with each of the uh, types of horticulture and agriculture to see how it would actually impact on them. But during the drought, this discussion expanded significantly because we also battle with alien vegetation. So we have a lot of species that have come from elsewhere in the world that seem to absolutely love our environment. Uh, and it's incredibly difficult to control them, especially in our mountainous areas where most of our water catchment comes from. So what we have been doing is employing uh, in uh, public employment programs uh, in the name of working for water um, because for us, job creation and the development of a biodiversity economy is absolutely critical. Job creation, especially after COVID now, has become even more of a focus for our government. So being able to bring the green economy, 
into this space where we're talking about job creation as well as protection from fire has been incredibly important for us. So we cover the landscape with fire protection associations and the first 30 minutes of aerial response to fires is covered um, by government because obviously that is the most important time to control it. So over the last two or three years, we found that we've really had an increase in fires in the urban wildland interface. And for us, it's been a devastating impact on some communities where we've lost both households as well as individuals in those devastating fires. Some of you may remember the media coverage from 2017, where one of our coastal towns, the George and Eisner area, was devastated by a massive fire that raged for several days. So we have deep sympathies for California and for the processes that you're going through now, and in fact, Australia. So we are also seeing that devastating effect of a landscape that requires fire a landscape that has included alien vegetation, which is difficult to control in water catchment areas. And that space where people are encroaching more and more on our urban, uh, on our, our wildlands. And therefore the interface and the chance of there being um, those wildfires running into the urban settlements and destroying property as well as lives is increasing time after time. We've been trying to focus our attention on what we are calling ecological infrastructure. So we've developed an investment framework, and this is trying to now get into everyone's mind that our green infrastructure, our ecological infrastructure is as important to us as the gray infrastructure, our man-made infrastructure. We need to maintain it, we need to restore it. So for us, ecological infrastructure is a source of a protection and risk reduction. Karen, thank you so much. And it's clear that we in California have a lot to learn around what you're doing in your subnational government in, in South Africa. I wanted that now shift to our state Senator, Henry Stern. Henry spent um, a lot of time at helping develop the framework for California's uh, climate action almost a decade ago. And now he finds himself representing a large part of, part of Los Angeles, uh, which a lot of us don't think is threatened by, by wildfire or, or climate impacts. But indeed, uh, quite, a, quite a lot of Henry's constituents live in that urban wildland interface. So Henry is really one of the big uh, thought leaders in California, really trying to connect dots between continuing to take climate action, reducing pollution, but then also building resilience of our, of our, of our nature. So Henry, uh, if you would share your thoughts, uh, given the California's horrific season of wildfires and where you think California and the world can go towards elevating nature-based solutions. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, and thanks for your bravery um, and courage to put science forward as the common foundation that we really all have to rely on here. Uh, even in the face of um, those who'd rather have it be some other way. Um, in some ways, we all wish this weren't the reality, but there's no denying when your home has burned down or uh, your community is decimated by a flood that climate change is here. So you've been courageous um, and we're gonna need more of that courage going forward. I'm struck by um, our, my co-panelists here too and the common fates that um, someone living in their beautiful semi-suburban, um, semi-natural life uh, in Georgian Eisner or in the Netherlands or living um, uh, among the native peoples in, a, in far northern reaches of California all have such similar fates in terms of our exposure to nature. And sometimes it may seem completely overwhelming or sometimes it may just seem that we've got to hard engineer our way out of it to just um, cut our way through nature and sort of force a human solution. What, I, what I've learned though, growing up in this area and living through fire and losing through fire, I, I lost my own home in the Woolsey fire a few years back. And um, you know, this, this district I represent has sort of an interesting confluence of not just climate fire risk, but uh, of sea level rise where we have uh, our shores being uh, 
continuously eroded over time and people wanting to resist that, but uh, the tide being uh, irresistible. Um, and flood and drought as well. Uh, we sit on huge aquifers here uh, in Los Angeles that could really be uh, drought solutions. Uh, but over time, we've polluted those groundwater aquifers and, and really undercut their ability to be the, the long-term storage banks that we so desperately need in a, in a drought-exposed Los Angeles. Um, so the solutions are really sitting all around us. And you know, here in California, the, the challenge is one of, of both uh, of, of acknowledgement of how beautiful life can be and how dangerous it can be at the same time and really fighting those personal instincts to want to live closer and closer to the risk uh, and one of investment. I think the scale of, of this risk is sometimes uh, inconceivable. And when you look at the, the confluence of both sea level rise, flood, extreme heat, drought, and then wildfire, um, it threatens not just uh, our economy as a whole, but you know, really could bankrupt global systems here uh, if we don't get ahead of it. So mitigation is gonna be crucial, but that investment in resilience is really what's gonna get us through it. Uh, you look at opportunities through nature, uh, like wetlands restoration, we've We've got opportunities um, all throughout California, but in the North, I'm the chair of the water committee and we're trying to find some way to have a sustainable solution out in the Delta. And part of that is gonna be about restoring our wetlands, um, not just as ways to, to, um, to deal with flood risk, but also to sequester carbon at the same time. And um, this administration is really led on that issue uh, through some voluntary agreements that are path breaking uh, in, working directly with farmers and working directly with impacted communities and finding uh, ways to meet in the middle. Uh, when, you, when you open up a floodplain and you allow say the flooding to occur into those wetlands, but you also create rice farming opportunities and at the same time, uh, uh, waterfowl habitat, you have a, a real series of wins there that I think can be replicated uh, much more broadly. Uh, likewise, here in Cal Southern California, you look at something like the LA River that most people don't think of as a river at all. It's a flood channel, just a concrete path driving right through the heart of Los Angeles, an urban kind of corridor. And yet um, that LA River itself can be a stormwater capture opportunity uh, to restore our, our uh, you know, integrity of, of our ocean pollution, but also a way for us to survive our next droughts and create new habitat really rewilding these urban areas and bringing some sense of nature and wildness to people in their lives that really don't get to access that. And lastly, I would just say with fire, you know, it's, it's upon us right now. And my, my heart is breaking over and over. I don't know how many more times our hearts can break while we watch our communities burn and our firefighters put their lives on the line. Um, we are inherently uh, demanding essentially a subsidy uh, for those who want to keep building deeper into these wildland urban interfaces uh, to enable that lifestyle requires such sacrifice from everyone else. And I think we're going to have to rethink um, what is fair and where we really should be developing further um, as we go forward. But the hardening itself and the way to preserve the communities that already exist um, really will rely not just on technology, but on the engineering of nature itself. Uh, Oakland uh, and native oaks, for instance, in the chaparral create incredibly strong buffer systems as do the manzanita and other sort of core uh, native species. But as uh, my good colleague from South Africa mentioned, these the alien species are what we call uh, uh, non-native species, these, the, we have mustard and grasses that come in that uh, will combust quickly and they, they, they really do threaten these communities and you're going to see more grassland fires coming up in Southern California, much mm -hmm. like we did see in the, uh, the bushlands, the bushfires in Australia with such speed and intensity that you can't stop them and they truly become deadly. Um, those risks uh, we need to address through nature. If we reestablish and restore those habitats, 
they know how to survive fire. Nature truly can be our teacher here if we let it. So thank you for honoring uh, uh, me by allowing me to be on this panel. And, and Secretary Crowfoot, uh, this administration has not skipped a beat from the last one. Um, California, even to be participating this directly in a UN climate week like this is reasserting its role as a global collaborator, as a leader. And I pray for the day uh, that we can be here alongside our federal government and really put America forward once again as the climate leader it ought to be. Hmm. Well, thank you, Senator Stern. Uh, you're getting some claps for that. Uh, it's obviously, you know, th there's such an important role that subnational leaders play across the world. And California is very glad to be partnering with other subnational governments um, who are often closer to that uh, natural resource management, uh, closer to sort of what's happening in communities than even federal governments are. So we're really looking forward to subnationals continuing to play an important role, obviously here at UN Climate Week, but, but broader. I wanna ask a question about biodiversity because while the United Nations has a, a convention on climate change, it also has one on biological diversity with the big conference of parties next year. And as I've been educated, you know, while we talk a lot about one planetary threat, which is climate change, we talk less about another one, which is mass extinction. And so I heard uh, Karen, for example, reference biodiversity and uh, probably others on the panel could speak about this. What do you see as the link between um, building climate resilience panelists and protecting biodiversity? And then interested in Hank getting in and talking about ways to integrate you know, make sure that the two UN processes are not completely siloed, but that our investments in nature are not only helping us um, uh, combat climate change and protect against climate impacts, but also preserving that, that, that biodiversity across the planet. Open to any, of, any, any thoughts any panelists have. Uh, thank you, Wade. If I can come in first, I think for us, biodiversity is a key component of building the response. Uh, for one, claiming back our areas from alien plants is a really important step for us because not only do they steal our water, uh, but they also change our soils. So they actually poison our soils for a lot of our local species. So for us, it's about making sure that our pollinators are healthy, that they have the right sort of felt available to them so that they can engage with agriculture that we do actually have resilience and resistance in our systems, that we don't have a genetic uh, isolation of our populations, whether they be wild populations or whether they be insects. Uh, you know, we really want to make sure that there's a security that is there. And I think we've realized as we've lost a lot of it, uh, just how much of a net that is. And for us, certainly, we don't have a lot of money as a developing country. And losing what essentially is free goods and services is crazy. So being able to restore and maintain those are really important for us. Henry. Yeah, what, uh, I don't mean to interrupt Hank. I, want, I do want to pass it over, but I would just say that here in Los Angeles, um, it is one of the biodiversity hotspots in the world that is also a major urban metropolis. And so how to find a way to coexist. Um, you have the 101 freeway and the 405 freeway, literally the most trafficked freeways in the entire United States. And I, I think by some estimations, the whole world cutting through the habitat of the last great apex predator of Southern California, the, the Southern California mountain lion. Um, and so we only have a few of those lions left and they're really on the verge of extinction within this decade. So the challenge to, a, to an Angelino is to say, do you really want to be standing idly by while we watch the, the collapse of a species on our watch? Uh, we're trying to build the wildlife corridors throughout Los Angeles, but make those same wildlife corridors the kind of natural fire buffers that we were talking about earlier. So if you can use native plants and you can use Oaklands to become buffer systems that are also wildlife corridors, we can not just prevent a mass extinction event on our watch, not just recapture the grandeur of living with wildness in our backyards to look out your window and say, I, I can actually see a lion. It's not just on the computer, it's in my life. And at the same time, prevent that fire risk from coming through. I think we've got something very special on our hands. 
well put. Hank. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think uh, there are many challenges. Eh? The, uh, the pandemic shows our disconnect with the environment, but it also shows how hard it is to invest in the right stuff. Uh, our immediate response, of course, is uh, Band-Aid and focused on health. But then recovery is only on jobs. So we take a strict, very limited, single focused financial economic position. And there is, I must say, alas, a business case for stupid infrastructure. So we continue to invest our trillions around the world in this infrastructure that makes us more vulnerable. So next to uh, creating awareness and understanding, it's also helping uh, to uh, ensure that we capture the values in these investments that you see through. And that means the moment we widen the scope, which is critically important, investing in holistic interventions that help us restore our biodiversity, help us restore nature, but also help it to create an environment that is in sync uh, with us or help us to become more in sync with the environment. Yeah. The moment we increase that scope and look across the sustainable development goals or across economic, social, cultural, and environmental issues, you also have to understand it, that it takes a little bit more time. Yeah. Capturing those returns takes more time, but investing in infrastructure yeah, in, uh, pays off on the short term, but has negative impacts on uh, indigenous community, on the environment, on our ecosystem, and so forth investing holistically across the SDGs uh, trickles down in everything uh, we aim for and helps us capture our goals. Yeah. Example is water. If you invest in water, health costs go down. But the Minister of Water or the Secretary of Water never talks to the Secretary of Health or uh, Infrastructure. So it is this disconnect in our systems that is also a disconnect in the business cases. So shy away from stupid infrastructure, invest in nature uh, and capture those health and environmental and ecological benefits. Thank you, Hank. I think Margo, you may have, have a thought. Well, I was just going to uh, say that monocultures have really contributed to where we're at today in these same age forests that carry wildfire so well. When we uh, use intentional burns to to put the ecosystems back in balance that encourages biodiversity. In the places that we have burned, we have seen species that have not been seen for a very, very long time. Pileated woodpeckers, flying squirrels. I didn't even know flying squirrels were, were around our area until we started burning, but they have returned. So there, there is definitely value to that. Yeah. You know, I know California government, subnational governments, federal government, national governments all over the world are talking about an economic recovery from COVID. And we talk a lot about not bringing the economy back to where it was, but bringing it forward where it needs to be. And uh, I know, Hank, you talk a lot about avoiding that stupid investment, but really investing in nature. And Karen talked about the natural infrastructure you know, restoring the health of our forests uh, across the world is not only uh, smart for protection of nature and that biodiversity, reducing wildfire threats, but also it, for us anyways in California, is the beginning of our water infrastructure. Uh, healthy uh, forest and mountain area is a healthy watershed, uh, which is so critical. Uh, so I think that this one point I think that we're all making uh, is the importance of making these uh, multi-benefit investments uh, to not only continue to sequester carbon, uh, protect communities, protect nature uh, and our natural resources. Maybe a, a last question uh, as we uh, conclude the panel. This UN Climate Week takes place uh, a year before our next Conference of Parties, uh, COP26, which is seen as a really important uh, discussion on the fate of our planet and climate change. And some refer to this or aspire to this coming 12 months as a super year for climate change and biodiversity. Traditionally, those conference of parties have really talked about how we reduce carbon pollution, and they need to continue to do that. But increasingly, 
there is more interest in also talking about climate resilience, which is how are we going to continue to adapt and thrive given the impacts of climate change that are already here. Um, maybe closing thoughts for each of you on just the importance of integrating climate resilience into this international discussion and any thoughts or hopes you have for the coming year uh, dialogue among uh, countries and parts of the world on climate change uh, as we move forward. Hank. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks again, Wade, and uh, uh, very topical uh, and, and necessary. And again, by nature, uh, come uh, part of those answers. Uh, just an exemplary project uh, coming from Chennai, where we invest in water and nature-based solutions on the scale of the neighborhood, uh, ensuring better health, uh, more equity and equality, but also sequestering carbon and cutting carbon because with uh, uh, that healthy water environment, there is no need to invest in desalination plants that eat up all the coal uh, uh, gen that are all coal generated. So uh, we invest in nature for a healthy environment. Uh, costs go down, investment costs uh, uh, go down with a third. Operation and maintenance costs go down with half and carbon footprint goes down with 80%. So, Adaptation, resiliency, and mitigation often go hand in hand through this lens of nature-based solutions. And yes, never shy away from cutting carbon. Eh? Uh, we, have to we have to make sure that the promise of the Paris Agreement, the 1.5 degrees, stays within reach. Uh, while at the same time, we have to protect our, uh, uh, our vulnerable places, our vulnerable environment, but also our vulnerable, vulnerable societies by investing in resiliency and adaptation. And with doing so by nature also spur mitigation actions. So we have a year and then another nine year in this decade of action. Uh, we have to put our promises. Uh, uh, we have to make sure that we uh, uh, deliver on the promises we made. And there are many examples from across the world that we can replicate and scale uh, to have the impact we need. Well put Hank. Closing thoughts from others. Karen. Well, I think from our side, we definitely want to use our science. We have incredibly good uh, spatial plans, biodiversity spatial plans. We've got good climate modeling. We know what to expect. We know what resilience we need to build. Um, and for us, it really is about recovering better because not only is it the health of our people, the livelihoods of our people, but it's also making sure that we have food security. So for us, it's all completely integrated. We don't have a choice. And uh, we know the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. Mm. So we increase resilience, we improve water security um, and lower fire risk. It's a win-win. Absolutely. Margot, final words. So climate resilience, of course, needs to be dressed on, addressed on many levels, uh, since I am here to uh, talk about the necessity of fire in our ecosystems, I will address it from uh, that view. Our forests have evolved with fire, not catastrophic, catastrophic wildfire, but intentional burns to maintain them to be park-like landscapes. We have come so far away from that, that we need to turn these things around. The controlled burns, if we do them on a landscape level, will create biochar on the mountainsides on a landscape level. Mm. Biochar sequesters carbon in the soil and it also acts as a gigantic water purifier for our ground and surface water. This provides resilience for our water supply and our forests. Indeed. Thank you so much. And Henry, the final word. We've had, um, I think, 79 uh, billion dollar plus climate disasters um, over the last, uh, I think, five years, uh, half, over half a trillion dollars of losses. Climate resilience investment 
really needs to be radically reimagined to, to understand the stakes and the scale. So we, we have been doing some investment to this point in climate resilience, but I think we're gonna have to see uh, not just a redoubling, but a complete reimagination of scale and scope. The good news is though, that money um, does get put to work. When you invest in things like forest health, the jobs intensity of that work really is hope for a future uh, where people are gonna have sustainable employment. Elevating the job of someone doing things like landscape management that we currently disparage and say, you're just clearing the brush or someone who's doing a fire treatment that that's somehow uh, a job that ought to be looked down upon, do a real engineering job. The natural engineers out there who are gonna do this work, the landscapers, um, young people truly do see a future in resilience. And if we have the courage uh, to scale our investment in climate resilience, we're gonna see a new prosperity upon us. Uh, the good news is science does know. Science does know this math is real. And when we invest in this resilience, um, it lifts all of us up. So to that future, Secretary Crowfoot and to the rest of uh, our partners here across the world, uh, I think we can make 2020 and into 2021 a truly historic year where we turn the corner. Well, those are elegant and appropriate final words. Thank you to all who have been watching and participating in this discussion. We look forward to partnering with you, whether you're part of a government across the world or a non-governmental organization, uh, a community leader, an educational researcher, a scientist. It will take all of us to elevate climate resilience into this international movement on climate action. And we look forward to making progress all together. Thank you very much.